Seriously, I am uh, trying to limit what I say because there's so much I could say, but I don't want to take up all of Brother Paul's time. He's a very dear friend of mine, a man who has been a friend and continues to be, a man whom I trust and a man whom I love dearly. He's been preaching for 56 years and has been consistent in his proclaiming the truth. A man who has great ability, a man of so many talents, he just amazes me at all he can do. A man who has great ideas. Uh, he has helped me tremendously in my going to him and asking him, here's what I'd like to do, how can we do this? He always comes with a tremendous idea. He's working with the church in Cedar Grove, Rogersville, Alabama. He and his wife, LaDon, have four daughters, seven grandchildren. Been married 52 years. He's written more than a dozen books. One of them, ready reference for growing Christians, has more than 400,000 copies in print. And you can get that as an app now either from Google Play or the App Store. I have it. I appreciate it. Uh, he ha owns Sane Publications. He publishes more than 70 books and tracts every year. He has put together the Studying Through the Bible class material. I've used that. I highly recommend it. If you want to know more about that, then see him. He owns Sane Video Productions and produces and directs a number of programs each month that air in a very broad market, several markets. He is going to tell you a little bit more about one of the things he is doing, and that is the Voices of the Past DVD sets. And I told him I'd let him tell you about it because he knows how to do that much better, clearer than I could do. He is a man of sterling character, a man of boundless energy. He's a man who is a very giving man, and you wouldn't know that because he doesn't announce that, but he is a very giving man. And we're glad that he has uh, consented to speak at this time, and Brother Wilk's absence on the topic, hope deferred makes the heart six, sick, <laughs> Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. The Voices from the Past series is a very special, passionate work that we're involved in. One of the instructors in this school made mention to brother, one of the brethren, of which many of you would know. When I say the word guy in woods, immediately major thoughts come to my mind. But one of the young men at that particular time in that class said, who is that? And you know that accents what situation we may have in the brotherhood today. We have many that are coming along and are tremendous spiritual young men, talented and are determined to hold to the faithful truth. But you know, my brother David made this statement a few years ago that I believe to be extremely true. That if we want our children and grandchildren to believe and have the attitude toward God and his holy word and reverence and respect for that which is right, then we have to help them by teaching them the same things that we were taught to sit somewhat at the same feet of the same men. Well, I realize that Brother Nichols and Brother Camp and Brother Wallace and Brother Woods and Andrew Conley and Wendell Winkler and so many, many more whom I dearly love that impacted my life beyond words, they're no longer with us. But in Hebrews 11 verse 4, we read, He being dead, yet speaketh. And some time ago, about five years ago actually, I started in the process of digitizing from VHS tapes. 
Now, for those of you that are real young, that's a tape that used to record things. And, uh, you know, we watch them on television. Uh, they're no longer, and nobody watches them anymore. And those tapes ruin after a period of time. But I'm taking those and digitizing them, turning them into a QuickTime or MOV file, and making them available on DVDs. We have nine volumes already available that have 14 lessons in each one. The first four volumes are 14 different speakers. The seventh one, volume seven, is Brother Garland Elkins only. Volume eight is Brother Curtis Cates only. I think I've got that wrong. And uh, volume seven is Brother Andrew Conley. Eight is Brother Elkins and nine is Brother Cates. Volume five is Wendell Winkler only. Volume six is Hugo McCord only. All 14 lessons by these individual men. Folks, I'm telling you that they're, they're priced extremely economically. It's not a matter of trying to make a large amount of money at all. If we can just break even, that'd be wonderful. But you need to listen to these. Some churches have used them for their Wednesday night Bible study or summer series and it's been to great benefit. Brother Bobby and I talked about it, and he asked me if I would explain it, and I certainly am glad to do that, but that's all I'm going to say. The Ready Reference app, if you need help toward that or if there's ways that you'd like to ask about that, it is the standard edition, the $9 edition of Ready Reference that is contained there, and I believe that it will help you. I'm sorry that Brother Wilkes is ill. And I do not intend or even attempt to try to fill his shoes this morning. I did take some of the material that he had prepared for this particular lecture series. And I'm going to try to make it my own and look at the subject found in Proverbs chapter 13. The verse reads, hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. We use the word hope quite free, uh, frequently. We use it very fluidly. For an example, I could say, since I piddle around with coins a little bit, that I hope that one day I, can, I might find a 1909 SVDB penny. It's worth about $10,000, a penny. Or I could say, you know, one of these days I'd love to be driving along in a country road and look over in some barn and see a dusty, covered 1957 two-door hardtop Bel Air. I mean, 283 Power Glide. I mean, pristine condition. All it needs cleaning up. It's low mileage. I, love, I hope to do that. You might say, one of these days I hope to lose some weight. <laughs> By the way, you want to know what my... 2017 goal was it was to lose 10 pounds I've only got 15 to go <laughs> <clears throat> doesn't work real well you might say that I hope that this sermon is going to be short that won't work real well either I want to thank you for your presence let's look at this particular topic the common definition is, is to want something to happen to be true or to think that it would happen or be true, according to Webster. The biblical perspective or detonation would be something like a sense of expectation, according to Vine. A sense of expectation. When we look at all of our lives and that which we maybe have hoped for, over the course of our lives, anticipated or wanted to take place. There are many things that no doubt come to our, our minds. Bobby mentioned that we have been married, my wife and I, for 52 plus years. There were a lot of goals that we had at the very beginning. Some of which came true, most of which did not. But largely because of our failure. Because we did not work the plan and the, the passage of which we're talking about, read it again with me, hope deferred, procrastinated, put off, or delayed. In other words, here's something for which we desire, that which we would like to have take place, but what it requires in order for that to become a reality, I've kind of put it off. 
I've allowed things to maybe come into the way of or, or cause me to put it off or procrastinate. And the passage says, hope deferred maketh the heart sick or sad, we might say. In other words, we have a goal, we have a desire, we have a longing, and because we don't bring that to fruition, it makes us sad. As I retrospectively look back over my wife and I's life, and oh, how we have been blessed. Oh, there's been mountains to climb. There's been challenges in life. The death of a six-week-old, our first child. The tornado that we survived. The house burning, six foot, eight inches of water in our home as our home was flooded in southeast Missouri. A lot of things that have transpired in our lives that might have delayed, but at the same time helped us become the ones that we are. The ones that maybe we can be in helping others who go through maybe similar trying situations. So even though we may not be that for which we aspire to be initially, there can be that which can be somewhat of a substitute as well. But let's develop our study further. If I were to ask you, did God hope? Does God hope even now? Is there something that God hopes for or expects or wants to occur I can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis as we read Adam and Eve put in that utopian state. And what marvelous accommodations, a marvelous place that it was. Was it not, no doubt, could we not view it from the standpoint of that which God desired of them? He hoped for them to continue in that righteous state, in that state of perfection as it were without partaking of the fruit of the tree that he had said, do not eat thereof. He hoped for that. He hoped that they would be obedient. But God's hope was deferred. Because as we can read very simply from that Genesis account, I know that you're familiar with it, but listen just for a moment. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. Back to Proverbs 13. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick or sad. It grieved the Lord at the heart. What did he say? I'm going to destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both men and beasts and creeping things and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. In other words, God hoped, but God's hope was deferred because of man's rejection of his instruction, of his desire, of his longing. But for an economy of time, let's fast forward. I believe that God also hoped to be Israel's king. But the people rejected him. Read with me in 1 Samuel chapter 8, or listen, either one. In verse, chapter 8, verse 1, And it came to pass when Samuel was old, and he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abahai, and they were judges in Beersheba, and his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes, and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves to gather, and came to Samuel unto Ramoth, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in, in thy ways. Now, make us a king to judge us like all the nations. That wasn't God's desire. That wasn't God's plan. But the people wanted a king like the nations around them. Verse 6, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. 
And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. God hoped. But the people rejected. And as a result, God's hope was deferred, as it were. Maketh him sad. He told him, it's not that they're rejecting you, they're rejecting me. As we might make an application in a very simplistic way, every time we fail God, every time we transgress the law of God, every time we fall short of the glory of God, we grieve God, we sadden God, we, we touch his heart and he's sorry because he wants us to do righteously. And hope is deferred. We might ask, what else does God hope for? And by looking at the testimony of the scripture, over and over we can find that he wants his people in the patriarchal, mosaical, and certainly now in the Christian age, he wants his people to know the statutes and the laws, the commandments, the will of God. We don't have the time to look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Or Deuteronomy chapter 11, very similar. And the statements that are boldly declared concerning to teach your children when you're sitting, when you're standing, when you're laying, at all times, in every way. I want them to know the will of God. I want them to know God. In Proverbs chapter 22, to train up thy children in the way they should go. We can read in the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 6, and your fathers, bring up your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. One of the most amazing passages that I find in the Word of God is found in the book of Joshua, the latter part of chapter 24. You will recall, no doubt, when they gathered all the men and the leaders to gather, Joshua, and he told them of the things that God had told him to do. In verse 14 of Joshua 24, now therefore, he said, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. But then that pivotal verse, verse 15, where in Joshua 24 we read, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, Choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, listen to him. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The testimony of that passage the implications and the great grandeur of pertinent lessons that are applicable to us. We need to be able to declare that. Oh, but there's another lesson here. As we go on down toward the end of the chapter, that same chapter 24, we read concerning Joshua, the son of Nun, and how he died. That's verse 29. Verse 31 declares, And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. Get it now. I mean, it's pause and just let it soak in. Joshua was such an influential, powerful, spiritual individual. I'm going to serve the Lord. Me and my house will serve the Lord. And that they did. But he went further than that. The influence that he had upon even those that were contemporary with him at that time. Listen to what it says. And, and all of the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. In other words, 
after Joshua was gone, those that had been around and influenced by him had heard him, sat at his feet, walked by him, saw him, the influence of it, he, they kept on serving. As you go in the Bible, one book does not chronologically fall always right after the other. In this case, it does. So going into the very next book, Judges chapter 1 and verse 3 where it says, Judah shall go up, behold, I have delivered him into the land. And then it drop on down just a little bit concerning Joshua again. And concerning the fact that he died. And concerning the fact that states very emphatically concerning his death. And in chapter 2 it says, And when Joshua had led the people and the children of Israel, and that man unto his inheritance possessed the land. Verse 7, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, which was seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. Almost verbatim to verse 29, 30, and 31 in Joshua 24. Now in the book of Judges, chapter 2, in verse 7 and following, where it says the same thing. Joshua lived, Joshua was faithful, and the elders were faithful afterwards. That's the way it should be, right? Oh, I wish that the story ended there. In verse 10 of that same second chapter of Judges, we read, And there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which He had done for Israel. How many times have we through our lives heard this statement? We're one generation away from apostasy. We fall short. One generation. We don't teach our children. God hopes, is counting on us teaching our children, our grandchildren. Oh, in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, we can read, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. In the New Testament, time and time again, there is that condition of having zeal without knowledge. There are so many in our world that are contemporary with us, television, uh, radio, printed page, uh, various ways of advancement of their theology, and they are so bubbling over with excitement and joy, and, and they are confident but they're not teaching the truth in its purity and simplicity. We've got to make sure, and God is hoping. And indeed, if that hope is deferred, it's making them sad. I realize that the economy of time that we have to look at various things, allow me to segue into these thoughts. God always hopes for that which is in our best interest. God does that which is for our good. Everything that He has done, everything that is being done, everything that will ever be done, is not Him sitting up there as a tyrant looking down and saying, I'm going to make life miserable for them. I'm going to make it hard on them but rather a long-suffering, suffering, loving, benevolent, generous, gracious, merciful God is on our side and wants us to be with Him forever in heaven. And what He has told us, what He wants of us, is in our best interest. He wants us to become His child in the family. He wants us to mature and to grow, not to remain babes in Christ. In fact, let me, let me just interject this particular scenario of thought. I remember, I was born in 46, I remember in 1957 being baptized by my father into Jesus Christ. Oh, at that rich old age of 11, I thought I, I was going to set the world on fire. I already had my hopes of becoming like my father, my, like my dad, being a gospel preacher. Dad was one of those hellfire and brimstone. He was excited. He believed in what he believed. He was determined. And I thought he was the greatest. 
But as I began to, the years passed, and all of a sudden I saw a little 13-year-old girl named Ladon. My thoughts were kind of sidetracked a little bit. You know what I'm saying. At the ripe old age of 18, and she was 17, we committed our lives to each other. She's not here. I'm not going to tell her I've said all that of her age. <laughs> she was only three when married. Yeah. <clears throat> and we started into public work, local work. Even more aggressively at that time, I thought... I want to know everything that I can. I want to learn this. I want to do that. I want to be able to quote Scripture. My dad had already challenged us boys to learn and memorize Scriptures. And I'm blessed even to this day because of those efforts. But time passed. Time slipped away. We had children. We moved to various places. There were things that we wanted to do. 1969, I went to Freed Hardeman College, as it was at that time. Stayed over in Jackson, Tennessee at the Thunderbird Motel. Got up at 5 a.m. each Monday through Thursday morning. Would get over there in time to hear Brother Nichols. How many of you were part of that audience, maybe? That's great to see you. Brother Franklin Camp and Brother G.K. Wallace. It was in 1969 in February on a Tuesday night that I heard Brother Andrew Conley for the first time. He lit a fire in that 24-year-old young man. Oh, I'd already been preaching, so-called. But the lesson was overcoming mediocrity, and the three points was having the courage to care, the willingness to work, and the dare to dream. And that renewed that heart of mine of I want to do this, I want to learn this, I want to be organized better, I want to grow in every way that I can. And I wish that I could say that I had continued that to this day at the age of 71. But I can't. You see, hope, that which I desired, that which I long for, was pushed aside in various reasons. It may be because I was involved pretty heavily in local work. Maybe it was because I was involved in a family. Maybe it was because I was involved in printing some books, things of which, all of which is acceptable and right within themselves. But now my point is this. To those of you that are students here at Memphis right now, or to those of us that are preachers in whatever stage of your life you're in right now. When I read Proverbs 13 and verse 12 and hear, Hope deferred maketh one sick. In recent months and years, this preacher regrets that I did not with greater passion with greater resolve. Dig into this book in a way that is deeper and, and greater than I have ever in my life. And it does make me somewhat sad and sick. As I realize that time is fleeting. As I understand, as goes the way of all men, I won't live that much longer here on earth and the intensity with which I'd like to know every single book, especially of the New Testament, but not to minimize the Old Testament. How I would like to spend months and months and months in the book of Psalms. How I would like to walk through the every single phrase and syllable of the Apostle Paul and let him impact my life. How that I would like to take notes and and have a commentary. Four or five years ago, I took InDesign, the book publishing uh, program, and created 66 data pieces. Dropped the text in of every book of the, New of the whole Bible. 
and I have notes on each individual one as I have studied in the last few years. Had I started that, what, 40 years ago? Look at what I cumulatively would have now. But I don't. That hope that I had was deferred and pushed forward. And now I no doubt will not live long enough to accomplish what I should have accomplished in my life. Three months ago, I started a chapter a week on Sunday morning in the Bible class at Cedar Grove. There are 260 chapters in the New Testament. There are 260 weeks in a five-year span of time. I told the class, I'm not sure I'll live long enough to finish that. I'm writing some little lesson sheets, passing them out. They're available on the web if you have any interest at all. But as simple and as simplistic as that is, I haven't even completed that. So set your goals at a young age even to be able to take that Bible and make it a part of your life. Put it in your heart as the psalmist said, Hide it in your heart that you might not sin. Oh, how love I thy law. It's in thy law. Meditate day and night. In other words, that's the book. That's the most important. And nothing else is important. And thus, do not defer that. What's our goal spiritually? What do we hope to accomplish? Here's the continuum of life. Here's at birth and here's our death, let's say. Where are you along this line? Younger people, and you think you have many years yet to live? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Older ones, on over here, you think you maybe have just a short time? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. It isn't so much where you are along this continuum, but which way you're going. Of what you're doing with that time. God wants you to know His will. Jesus said, the words that I have spoken, the same shall judge you at the last day. John 12, 48. Heaven and earth will pass away, my words will not. This is the truth of God. John 17, 17. That can make us free, John 8, 32. There's a lot of things that I enjoy in life. Kentucky basketball is one of them presently. But folks, Kentucky basketball or any type of football, any type of other sports, means absolutely nothing compared to making sure that my Lord reigns and rules my heart and that I know Him. The wise man of old said, hope deferred. I plan to do that one day. I'm going to be a better husband one day. I'm going to be a better father. Take more time with my children one day. But that which is deferred, that which is put off and delayed, kind of pushed back to the side, should make us sick, sad. Oh, he continued by saying, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. I understand that a little bit too in a personal way. It's not all about Paul today. I just, I'm using myself as a bad example of what I did not do and what I wish I had done and what I long, passionately wish I had and more at that time. But now... When that hope becomes a reality, didn't used to write in my Bible. Now when I open the pages and I write in throughout the pages of this book, and the wealth of encouragement and strength, the help that it brings, the comfort when the storms of life are raging, it's a tree of life. It's a source of tremendous encouragement. Brother Dan's lesson last night, unbelievably unparalleled. My wife and I have already decided we're going to listen to it every day. Because the Lord is my shepherd. 
The Lord is my tower of strength. The Lord is my place of refuge. To whom can I go? You remember Simon Peter? You have the words of life. You have the way that leads to eternal life. You know how to get there. But it's not only that. He said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. That where I am, there you may be also. We can do it. We start as babes, 1 Peter 2.2. 2. We add to our faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, all of that which is mentioned in 2 Peter chapter 1, 5 and following. We make the fruit of the Spirit a part of our life, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. We're not to be conformed to the world, Romans 12, 2, but rather transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're not to love the world or be friends with the world, 1 John 2 and James 4, but rather to realize that we've got to come out from among them and be ye separate. We are peculiar people, holy nation, royal priesthood. And the only ones that are heaven bound. As a result of the blood of Christ being shed. And that precious invitation that says come and I'll give you rest. We can no longer be aliens and strangers and pilgrims. But a part of the family of God. And one day. One day. Listen to me carefully. The sweetest words that could ever be spoken in our behalf is welcome home. Your mansion is ready. Well done, good and faithful servants. Let's not wait until we are older in years to begin that marvelous fulfillment of what God desires for, our, for what He hopes in our lives. Wherever we are, we can't undo what we did not do or failed to do then, but we can start now and certainly blaze a trail that's acceptable to God. Thank you.